Welcome back, Chappelle. All right, so first test coming up soon, and this will be the last flip that you have before that test, but it's going to be a pretty short one. I'm thinking that we're going to be I'll play pretty much under 10 minutes, okay? But, okay, so in class we talked about the Peloponnesian War in the last flip, right? Very important concept. Make sure you find that in your notes. It's an important event to remember and know because it is referenced several times on the test. As remember, this 27-year-long war that occurred between Athens and Sparta during the classical period, following the fact that Athens starts kind of getting a little like overzealous, and then Sparta, of course, because of this extreme rivalry that had been developing between the two of them ever since the Persian Wars kind of blew up and decimated a lot of southern Greece, right? Leaving, of course, room for two huge historical figures to show up, Philip II of Macedonia and his son, Alexander III, a.k.a. Alexander the Great, right? They start taking over the entirety of southern Greece using things like diplomacy, threats, bribes, and like a lot of other different systems, also including very, very intense military structure and organization, and they start using different military tactics to actually outwit and outduke a lot of these other... Uh, Greek city-states throughout uh, southern Greece. Of course, eventually ending up when they take over Athens and their big ally, Thebes, right? Now, as we also remember, though, uh, Alexander is going to become ruler of all of Macedonia and its holdings uh, at the age of 18 when his dad gets stabbed to death at his daughter's wedding, right? Uh, then he, like, sets out and he goes over and he takes over the entire Persian Empire, chasing after this guy named Darius III, right? And in this entire sense, though, like, keep going, keep going, keep going, he ends up, like, winning 300 separate battles in a row on his steady horse, Bucephalus, and then actually ends up conquering the entire Persian Empire and <clears throat> would eventually, though, die of a sudden fever, right? Dies of a sudden fever without any heirs to the throne and actually leaves the entire empire to three of his best generals. And over the next 300 years, the empire slowly begins to fall apart because men begin to battle for control, right? One of his generals actually is believed to try and kind of make himself the king of this new Hellenistic territory due to the fact that he had Alexander's body, right? He's like, oh, well, I have Alexander's body, so I am the ruling authority. And apparently he had Alexander's body preserved in a giant vat of honey, right? Which is really, really crazy. And the other crazy part is we have no clue where Alexander's body is at all. Like, it is undiscovered, uh, there are several different teams of archaeologists that have spent years trying to find it, but no one has been able to find Alexander the Great's remains, right? But we do know that the Hellenistic period began following his death, right? Once Alexander died and the three generals that he left in charge, one of them being Ptolemy, who takes over in Egypt, uh, once that happens, the Hellenistic period begins, okay? Very important concept to remember is that the Hellenistic period is a blend of Greek, Persian, Egyptian, and Indian cultures, right? It is considered another golden age, but it is considered kind of a, not worldwide, but almost a known world, known civilized world at the time, golden age. Uh, during the Hellenistic period, uh, you're going to see huge growth in art, government, science, intelligence, mathematics, philosophy, all kinds of stuff. And a big part about this is this is defined as the greatest growth period of the uh, ancient Greek time periods. And also, it is defined by one key concept, cultural diffusion. If any of these like Greek time periods has anything to do with cultural diffusion, it is this one. And it is referenced as such on the test, okay? But the Hellenistic period began once Alexander died, right? And the capital of this Hellenistic territory would be right here in Alexandria, Egypt, right? Alexandria, Egypt would become the new capital and new kind of huge hub of this Hellenistic empire, right? It boasted everything from Greek marble to Arabian traded spices. It was home to over a million people, right? Massive, massive, massive city, which would actually play a lot of major, major important roles throughout history continuing forward. We're gonna see the Romans when they take over Alexandria eventually, ending the Hellenistic period and kind of ending Greeks' dominance as the major Western society. Now, looking at these two things right here, speaking of Alexandria, Egypt, what these two things are is they are an Egyptian cultural device, right? These are known as sarcophagus, or if you're saying it plural, sarcophagi, right? Sarcophagi are what th things that are these large coffins that create or that are created to contain mummified bodies, right? 
Now, as we remember from talking about Egypt way, way back in the day, Egyptians mummified their dead because they believed that the necessity of any Egyptian person to be able to function in the afterlife was to have a whole preserved and intact body, right? So they would use this process of mummification to remove the organs, dehydrate the body, dry it out, wrap it in linen, and put it inside of one of these. And these things, again, are called sarcophagi, right? Or a sarcophagus, okay? Now, the interesting part about these particular sarcophagi is look at the faces of the people on them. Now, this person has the complexion of what you would believe an Egyptian person may look like, right? Darker skin, something closer to a North African skin tone, higher amounts of melanin, right? This one, on the other hand, has sharp, dark facial hair and white or lighter melanin-based skin because this person is of Greek descent. Why is a Greek person inside of an Egyptian sarcophagus with a mummified body? It's because of this Hellenistic period, right? These mummified bodies serve as kind of an example of the Hellenistic period in ancient Greece because these people would not normally be mummified because that is an Egyptian cultural idea and Greek people typically cremated or buried their dead wherever they could, right? Now, this person, of course, is a straight up Greek person inside of, inside of a sarcophagus, right? You can see the Greek laurel wreath around the hair, but then it's inside of a sarcophagus with a mummified body inside. So it's showing that cultural diffusion and blending, right? Women also in the Hellenistic period are gonna be revered, become poets, philosophers, and some of them even become rulers. The most famous of those Hellenistic female rulers is most definitely, without a shadow of a doubt, Cleopatra VII, right? Cleopatra, yes, the Cleopatra, the same Cleopatra that fell in love with Mark Antony, the same Cleopatra that had a child with Julius Caesar, we'll talk about that story later on, the same Cleopatra that overthrew her husband and became queen of the Egyptian Empire and the remaining Hellenistic Empire during the late Republic period of ancient Rome, right? So she serves as a great example of how women had a higher role within the Hellenistic period, right? Now, keep going forward, though. Also, you're going to see new ideas come out of the Hellenistic period as well. It's going to be a great center for intellectual growth. You're going to see new art, but you're also going to see new scientific development and scientific theory. So, for example, Hellenistic philosophers believed and were the first people to theorize that not only could the universe be set up with a heliocentric orbit, which is they believed the sun is in the middle and the planets go around it, which we know to be the factual, true actual setup to the universe, or our, our solar system anyway. They also, though, had theories, and several other um, different major figures from this time period believed in a geocentric orbit of the planets, the Earth-centered universe, which is the one that Aristotle actually theorized as well. And then also you're going to see the uh, Library of Alexandria is going to contain the tomes and scrolls and information from this entire time period. Advances in medicine are going to be like, happening during this period. A very famous philosopher named Hipp Hippocrates is going to bring up the Hippocratic Oath, the idea that all doctors should help or aid those who are sick using their gifts and talents, right? So huge, huge, massive leaps forward. This very famous sculpture, the Venus de Milo, is also believed to have been created during the Hellenistic period. But the most famous out of all of these super intelligent people that are coming out of the Hellenistic period during these, this uh, particular era in the late, uh, late period ancient Greece has got to be this guy, Archimedes, right? Archimedes was the most famous inventor of the Hellenistic period. He came up with several different devices and a lot of different theories. He came up with one called the Archimedes screw, which was the very, very first well, which actually can be, ooh, whoa, 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 which can actually be seen right down here, right? Showing how a screw on a an inclined plane wrapped around a central fulcrum can actually lift or raise objects or water up from one level to another, right? Also, theories on density. He's going to come up with another major theory on density as well, talking about the buoyancy and displacement of water from certain materials. And there's a very famous, very famous story about how Archimedes was approached by a king that was given a crown. 
and the king was told that the crown was made out of solid gold, right? Now, Archimedes couldn't figure out a way to figure out if this crown was made out of solid gold or not because the king told him he wasn't allowed to melt it and was not allowed to cut into it, right? So Archimedes sat down one day and he's like, I can't figure out how to figure out the density and the volume displacement of this particular crown without cutting into the thing. What am I supposed to do? And so he decides, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take a bath. I'm going to relax. I'm going to take a bath. So he actually goes in to his bath sits down in the water and notices that when he gets in the water, because of his specific volume, the water line raised as he got into the bath and it actually displaced water. So he was like, Eureka! And he jumps up out of his bath, buck naked, and runs through the streets screaming, Eureka, Eureka, Eureka! And he figures out to take the crown and to put it in a volume of water to figure out how much water it displaces so he can figure out the specific density and gravity of that particular material that the crown was made out of, right? Turns out that the crown was not made out of solid gold as well, right? He also apparently theorized how to develop a heat ray using reflective images off of mirrors and he also came up with a bunch of math junk now the biggest math junk piece that he came up with though is the law of diminishing returns in a parabolic area but that's for calculus and stuff which you may end up learning eventually to try and figure out the area of a curved or of a curved plane right and it's this law of diminishing returns where it's like we'll take the volume of this and then this and then this and then this and it's a whole thing but we'll talk about that stuff later on so I hope you all have a great weekend. This is the very last one. We just needed to kind of talk about the Hellenistic period and it being a huge growth of cultural diffusion. And this one is a very, very short flip, and it's not nearly as in-depth as we typically go with a lot of other flips. And the reason why we're not going that far is because you have your test coming up, and I didn't want you to be kind of overwhelmed, right? But you all have a good one. I'll see you all later. Study hard, okay?